Hello, Milwaukee! Are you fired up yet? Are you ready to go? Oh, it is good to be back in Wisconsin. Good to be back in the Midwest. And good to be back in Milwaukee. Now, you may have noticed we're doing our rally a little early because we have to wrap up before the Packers Lions game starts. So, cheese heads, don't worry, I'm not trying to compete against that. And the Bears are also playing, so. Hey! Uh, right now we're on the same team, people. I am here for a very important reason, and that is to ask you to vote for one of my favorite Congresswomen, Gwen Mo. For your wonderful Senator, Tammy Baldwin. And for the next President of the United States, Kamala Harris. If you have not voted yet, today is the last day of early voting in Milwaukee. You can still get it done before the day. I won't be offended if you leave right now. If you have an absentee ballot, do not put it in the mail at this point. Bring it to a drop box at any early voting site. And if you can't vote early, make a plan to vote on election day. November 5th, polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Just go to WIS, uh, let me make sure I get this right, wisdems.org slash vote. And that'll tell you where you can go. And remember to bring your photo ID. And then get your friends and your family to make a plan to vote too, because together, Three days, we have a chance to choose a new generation of leadership in this country and start building a better and stronger, a more hopeful America. Now, I, I don't think it's any news to you that this election is going to be tight. It's going to be tight because a lot of Americans are still struggling. You know, as a country, sometimes I think we forget. We have been through a lot over these last few years. We had a historic pandemic that wrecked havoc on communities and businesses, families. The disruptions from the pandemic caused price hikes, put a strain on family budgets. And even before the pandemic, a lot of Americans felt that no matter how hard they worked, treading water was the best they could do. So I understand why people are looking to shake things up. What I cannot understand is why anybody would think Donald Trump will shake things up in a way that is good for you. Because there is absolutely no evidence that this man thinks about anybody but himself. This is a 78-year-old billionaire who has not stopped whining about his problems since he rode down that golden escalator nine years ago. And, and, and we've seen it for over a decade now, this show of his. The late night tweets, all caps. The, the, the weird tangents and, and crazy conspiracy theories. The constant attempts to sell you stuff. Gold sneakers, a $100,000 watch, even a, a Trump Bible. He wants you to buy the Word of God, Donald Trump edition. He's got his name right there next to Matthew and Luke. Who does that? But the point is, Donald Trump 
is not thinking about you. His, his entire campaign, just like his entire presidency, has always been based on him. It's about him, his status, his money, his ego, his grievances, his insecurities. He wants the middle class to pay the price for another huge tax cut that would mostly help him and his buddies. He doesn't care if he costs more women their reproductive freedom because apparently he doesn't think that it's gonna affect him. It won't, it won't make a difference in his life. But most of all, Donald Trump wants us to think that, that this country is hopelessly divided between us and them, between real Americans, quote unquote, who support him, of course, and outsiders who don't. Because he thinks that having America divided, having people angry and resentful, will increase his chances to get elected. It's as simple as that. And I'm here to tell you, Milwaukee, we do not need another four years of Trump's arrogance and incompetence and division. America's better than that. America's ready to turn the page. America's ready for a new story, a better story. We are ready for a president, Kamala Harris. And the good news is Kamala Harris is ready for the job. This is a leader who has spent her life fighting on behalf of people who need a champion. Kamala was raised by a middle class family. Mostly by a single mom. She, she knows what it's like to have to scrap, save, to make ends meet. When she was in college, she worked at McDonald's to help put herself through school. She didn't pretend to work at McDonald's when it was closed. Her mom was, was I, I guess, five feet tall. A brown woman with an accent. You can imagine that she wasn't always given her due. But her mom taught Kamala and her sister not only stand up for herself, but to also stand up for injustice. And that's exactly what Kamala has been doing her entire career. As a prosecutor. As a prosecutor, Kamala stood up for children who had been victims of sexual abuse. As Attorney General of the state of California, she fought the big banks and for-profit colleges, securing billions of dollars for people that had been scammed. And after the mortgage crisis, Kamala pushed me and my administration hard to make sure that homeowners got a fair settlement. So again and again, Kamala has fought for people who need a divorce, who needed a champion, and she delivered on their behalf. That's who Kamala is. And you may not, you may not agree with every decision she makes, but I can promise you, if you elect her, she will see you and hear you, and she will have your back every single day, and she will work hard on behalf of all Americans. And by the way, she'll have an outstanding partner in Governor Tim Walz. I love that dude. Uh, he, is, he is a veteran, he's a teacher, he's a coach. 
He was a great governor. Turns out he can even take a vintage truck apart and put it back together again. You think Donald Trump can do that? Do you think Donald Trump has ever changed a tire in his life? If he gets a flat tire, he calls his, he, he calls his, his chauffeur, Jeeves. Jeeves changed that tire. I don't know if the chauffeur's actually named Jeeves, but I like to think it's Jeeves. <laughs> the, the point is, if you elect Kamala and Tim, they know something about your life because it's been their life. They'll be focused not on their problems, they'll be focused on yours. And that's why, for so many of us, the choice in this election seems like it should be so clear. I, I mean, on the one hand, you've got a former president whose time in office was characterized by so much chaos and scandal that he was impeached not once, but twice. Twice. And on the other end, you've got somebody who cares about working people and has served with distinction in every office that she has ever held. But here, here's the thing, Milwaukee. We, we live in a big country. Wisconsin's a big state. People have a lot of different points of view. There, there, there are voters out there who are just passionate about Trump, which we are about Congress. And just like the last two elections, this one is going to be determined by a handful of people who are genuinely torn about who to vote for or are debating whether to vote at all. Which is why, if y'all don't mind, I want to speak directly to those who may be watching, may be listening, friends of yours, maybe a few of you who are still here, who are still undecided. Those of you who, who the, 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 those of you who see Donald Trump's flaws but don't feel like you know Kamala well enough, or those of you who are concerned about democracy but are more concerned about making ends meet, or those of you who understand the difference between the two candidates but don't think this election will actually make a difference in your life. Now, when I when I talk to folks that are genuinely undecided, the first thing they'll say is that they want a president who will improve the economy. And that makes sense. Even though wa wages are steadily growing, unemployment is relatively low, inflation is finally slowing, but the price of everything from healthcare to housing to groceries is still too high. The question I ask them, the question I think we all have to ask ourselves is, who's really going to do something about it? Now, I... In talking to people, I've realized, so I, I want to address this. It turns out one of the reasons people think Donald Trump will improve the economy is because they watch The Apprentice. I'm serious. No, no, no. I, I'm not kidding. I'm not. I, I mean, I've heard this people say this. Um, I happened to miss that show when it was running, but it was really popular. So, so I want everybody to be clear. That was not reality, that was a reality show. The truth is, Donald Trump was given $400 million by his daddy. That's how he got rich. And somehow his company still managed to declare bankruptcy six times. So, so, that, so let's put that aside for a second. When it comes to actual policy, Donald Trump has offered up two ideas. The first is, once again, he wants to give another massive tax cut to billionaires and big corporations. Now, some people might hear that and they say to themselves, well, I remember the economy being pretty good when he first came into office. It was, because it was my economy. I, I had spent eight years cleaning up the mess the Republicans left me. Y'all remember, auto plants all across the Midwest, including here in Wisconsin, flat on their backs, on the verge of bankruptcy. 
And we worked and we worked. And after eight years, I then handed off over 75 straight months of job growth and low inflation to Donald Trump. And the only thing his tax cuts did back then was to help folks that were already doing good and drive up the deficit in the meantime. Trump's other big idea is to slap a tariff on everything from food to TVs. Now, almost every economist who has looked at this idea says that won't lower prices, that makes prices higher. And, and, and when, when he's challenged on this point, Trump will, will brag about, well, look at gas prices. They were $2 a gallon when I was in office. You know why gas was so cheap? Because there was a global lockdown during COVID and nobody was driving. And he's talking about it like it was the good old days. I want us to remember that. Yes, gas was super cheap. Because we were stuck inside the house. Nobody was buying gas. So, so then I'll hear people say, well, at least Donald Trump sent me a check during the pandemic. Oh, wait, wait, y'all have heard this. I, I guarantee you some of you have heard this from somebody. So I want to clear this up as well. At the start of COVID, Democrats and Republicans joined together to send out emergency checks. And he was there. And, and you know what? Joe Biden worked with Congress and sent out an emergency check during the pandemic. Just like I worked with Congress to give people emergency relief during the Great Recession. There was not anything unique about what Donald Trump did, except unlike Joe Biden and me, he put his name on the check as a marketing tool. I, I never thought of that. For me, for Joe Biden, it was not about taking credit and advancing our politics and feeding our egos. It was about helping people during tough times. So, but the, the, the point is, for those of you who are still making up your minds out there, do not give Donald Trump the benefit of the doubt because he was on a reality show. And, and certainly do not give him credit for an economy that he inherited. There is only one candidate who has offered serious ideas about how to drive down prices and make this economy work for everybody, and that is Kamala Harris. She's going to go after corporations that unfairly jack up prices. She's got detailed plans to work with local governments and the private sector to build three million new affordable homes all across America and then help first-time home buyers with their down payments. She's going to give a tax cut to 100 million middle-class and working Americans, helping small businesses get started, helping first-time parents with the basic cost of having a child. Now let's talk about health care. If you ask Donald Trump what he's going to do to make health care more affordable, he's got one answer, and that is end, repeal the Affordable Care Act. And, and he's not by himself. The other day, the Speaker of the House, the Republican Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, said there would be, quote, no Obamacare if Trump wins. Now, do not move. Well, now, neither of them can really explain why they want to end it, except for the fact that I did. The, the problem they have is, guess what? The Affordable Care Act works. Almost 50 million people have gotten health care because of it. 
another 50 million have the security of knowing the insurance companies can't deny them coverage because of a pre-existing condition. The more people benefit, the more popular it has become. Which is why a couple a couple weeks ago, some of y'all saw this, uh, Trump's running mate, Mr. Vance. Do not boot, oh. Mr. Vance had the nerve to say Donald Trump, quote, salvaged the Affordable Care Act. What? 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 Donald Trump spent his entire presidency trying to repeal the, the Affordable Care Act, trying to tear it down. And he couldn't even do that right. And now, eight years after he was elected, he was asked, well, if you did re uh, repeal it, what, what would you replace it with? And, and he, he, he looked, and he kind of fumbled around, and they said, well, I, I, I've, got a, I've got concepts of a plan for how to replace it. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. Let's say your boss gives you an assignment, says, I need it by Friday. Friday rolls around. The boss comes up to you and says, uh, did you finish that project for me? You say, well, actually I haven't started. But I do have a concept of a plan. <laughs> or, or you can try it at home. Honey, did you do the dishes? You throw out the, the trash? Uh, I can watch this football game. But I do have a concept of a plan to do the dishes. How's that going on? You're on the couch. If it would not work for you, why should it work for the President of the United States? It shouldn't. The good news is, Kamala Harris doesn't have concepts of a plan. She has actual plans to limit out-of-pocket health care costs, to keep lowering prescription drug prices, and Kamala Harris understands the threat to women's health that has been posed by the decision of Donald Trump's Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade. Since then, we have seen effective ab abortion bans in 20 states. Infant mortality rates have begun to tick up. Doctors are afraid to provide potential life-saving treatment to at-risk mothers. Uh, I, I've always said, I respect those who, for religious or ethical reasons, would, would not consider terminating their own pregnancy. But if nothing else, freedom must surely mean that women themselves get to make these profoundly intimate decisions, not politicians. And that's why, if Congress passes a bill to restore the reproductive freedom that women had for nearly 50 years and that Donald Trump bragged about taking away, Kamala Harris will sign it into law. That's what Kamala stands for, the concepts of a plan actual plan to make your lives better, to protect your freedoms. Now, whenever Donald Trump is challenged on his lack of plans on the economy or health care or anything else, he will fall back on his favorite issue and that is immigration. According to Trump, it does not matter what the issue is, how, uh, housing, crime, lost pet, Hey, if you just let him round up whoever he wants, ship him out, all your problems will be solved. America will be great again. So, so, so let's talk about immigration for a second. I, I, a lot of folks have legitimate concerns about what's happening at our borders. It is critical that the next president work with Democrats and Republicans to make sure our borders are orderly and secure. We are a nation of immigrants. We are also a nation of laws. And we have to make sure that those two things 
work together. But, you know, whenever the issue of immigration comes up, Donald Trump likes to say it's, it's Kamala Harris's fault. She's been vice president for four years. Why didn't she fix it? How about, wasn't Donald Trump president for four years? Why didn't he fix it? If rounding up and deporting millions of desperate people is the answer to everything, why was the number of undocumented immigrants basically the same when Donald Trump left office as when he took office? Think about that. I'll tell you why. Because Donald Trump doesn't have a real plan to solve immigration. He's got a concept of a plan. And it's a mean and ugly concept. You know what would actually bring order to the border and fix our immigration system? The bipartisan deal that Kamala Harris supported, even though it was written by one of the most conservative Republicans in Congress, Donald Trump, on the verge of the vote, told Republicans not to vote for it. Because his mindset was, I want this issue to run on. I want to be able to fear Mongo. That, that, that's how I'm going to win this election. That's how we will think. We do not need a president of Wisconsin who will make problems worse just to make their politics better. We need a president who cares about solving problems and making your life better. And that's what Kamala Harris will do. And to help her do it, She's going to need a Senate full of public servants like Tammy Baldwin. Tammy spent her career fighting for things like good jobs, and affordable health care, and medication, and personal freedom. She knows how to make a difference. She has proved that she can make a difference. Remember how the Affordable Care Act lets young people stay on their parents' health care plan until they're 26? Tammy broke that part of the bill. She knew it was important to Wisconsin families. That's the kind of workhorse and not show horse that we need in Washington. That's the kind of person who's going to help get Kamala in office and help Kamala get stuff done. Somebody who shares our values. Somebody who wants to move this country forward and not back. Yeah, she's really good. She, Tam, Tam is legit. Now there's one last thing I hear from undecided voters, and this, I'll be honest with you, may be the toughest answer. Tough, toughest answer. They'll tell me that at the end of the day, from their perspective, politicians, are all the same. They make empty promises, regardless of who ends up being the next president, it's not really going to make a difference in their lives. And I know you've heard that from friends, neighbors, co-workers. And I think we, we can all understand why people might feel that way. You know, if you live in a small town in rural Wisconsin, we saw the plant close down, jobs get shipped overseas, Young people start moving away because they don't feel like they've got a, a fair shot at, at advancement. You're going to feel skeptical about government being able to bring about real change. If you live in a neighborhood in Milwaukee where gun violence and drug trade are back to life, parents are scared about their kids getting to and from school, you're going to feel the same way. So if that's your perspective, I, I want to be honest. Politics, you're right, po politics is not going to solve all of your problems. And the, it did not solve every problem, but it, it, it's made a difference. It's, it's provided people with some security, and I could not have done that without your vote. Now, I will give you the opposite example. When I was president, so we had to deal with Ebola and H1N virus, and so I started really studying issues of pandemic, 
and I called my team together in my second term and I said, we need to put together a playbook for how to deal with pandemic. The same way we have a playbook for how to deal with natural disasters, hurricanes, floods, etc. What are we going to do? So we put together the playbook, we called together all the agencies, sat them down, we ran what are called tabletop exercises to practice. How are we going to deal with state public health systems? How, what are we going to do with the schools? What kinds of travel restrictions might be put in place? How do we accelerate vaccines? Had it all in this big book. And so when Donald Trump comes in, I hand it to him. Where's the book? I handed it to him and apparently it was lost. And three years later, a pandemic hits. Now, I want to be fair on this. No matter who was present, the pandemic was going to be a terrible crisis. People were going to get sick, people were going to die. But if you look at a country like Canada, their per capita death rate, think about this, their per capita death rate was 60% lower than in the United States. Over a million people died during the pandemic here in the U.S., so do the math. 60% of a million people is 600,000 people. That's somebody's grandparent. That's somebody's parent. That's somebody's husband or wife. Somebody's co-worker. Somebody's friend. That might be alive if we had had a competent president who was focused on dealing with the crisis instead of wondering whether we could treat COVID by injecting bleach into our arms. So if somebody tells you this election does not matter, tell them respectfully that having a president who understands policy and is willing to put in the work does matter. And for those of you who even after they hear that are still on the side, let me tell you what else matters. Values matter. Character matters. A, a, a president makes a million decisions. And most of the time, they're judgment calls. The easy decisions, the obvious decisions get made by somebody else. The hard ones are what gets to the president's list. And you can't anticipate every issue that's gonna come down the pipe. And so, it's really important. Does that person have moral, a moral compass? Do they have some integrity? What, are, are they focused on doing what's right by the American values matter. Some of you know that when I was growing up, I, I didn't have a father in the house. But I did have people around me. Stepfather, grandparents, teachers, coaches, most of all my mom. Who taught me the difference between right and wrong. Who, 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 who showed me what it meant to have integrity, to be honest, to be responsible, to work hard to treat other people the way I wanted to be treated. Now, there were times where I did not perfectly live up to those values, especially when I was a teenager. But as I got older, I internalized those values. I tried to live up to them. Not perfectly, but I, but I, I knew they were important and I, and I wanted to be that person. And I suspect most of you grew up the same way. And one of the most disturbing things about this election, not just this election, but Trump's entire rise in politics, you can see it just pervading our political culture, is, is how we seem to have just set aside those values that we were taught. A, a month ago, we had one of the deadliest hurricanes in American history. President Biden and Vice President Harris were in some of the communities that were affected meeting with local officials, comforting families. And at the same time, Donald Trump and, and Vance were making up stories about the Biden administration withholding aid 
not giving it to Republican areas, giving it to undocumented immigrants, just making stuff up. Even Republicans on the ground said that's not true. That's a bald-faced lie. My question is, when did that become okay? I, I, at a time when people were desperate and they need help, why would you try to exploit that for political gain? No matter where you stand on the issues, no matter what party you belong to, why would you go along with that? If your co-workers acted like that, they wouldn't be your co-workers for very long. If you had family members, if you had a family member who acted like that, you might still love them, but you wouldn't put them in charge of anything because you'd realize they're not trustworthy. And yet, when Donald Trump lies or cheats or shows utter disregard for our Constitution, when he calls service members who died in battle losers or fellow citizens firm, so many of his supporters are willing to excuse it or justify it or overlook it. You know, it's been 20 years since I first appeared before a national office at the Democratic Convention in Boston. And, and in, that, in that speech, in that speech I insisted there are no red states or blue states, no black America or white America, or gay or straight America. It was just the United States of America. And, and some people, some people at the time and certainly in subsequent years thought, uh, that's naive, given how divided the country seemed at the time. But you know what? It was based on my experience. I was traveling across Illinois and later traveling across places like Wisconsin, Michigan, and the rest of the country. I had witnessed time and again the goodness, neighborliness, their values, integrity, bound people together. I had seen people who would oppose the Iraq war stand up and salute a veteran or volunteer to help wounded warriors. I, I had seen conservative Republicans provide shelter and support for young immigrants and help homeless folks in, in their communities. It didn't matter what part of the country it was what race or faith people were from. I saw people live up to that golden rule. And a lot has changed since then. I've gotten grayer, obviously. Our politics has gotten a lot more toxic. Social media is full of conspiracy theories and outright lies. Some of it, by the way, produced by the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians. And all those messages fed into our phones, into our brains, isolate us and divide us, encourage us to mistrust each other, even hate each other. But I remain convinced that is not the kind of country most of us want. I believe that the vast majority of people in this country are good, and that they are honest, and that they are generous, and that they are fair. And whether they are Democrats or Republicans or Independents, they want those values reflected in their politics. And whatever questions you may still have about Kamala's position on this or that issue, I can tell you that not just in this campaign, but throughout her entire career, she has conducted herself with grace and with dignity, that she respects people of all races and all faiths, that she does not demonize those who do not support her or threaten those who disagree with her, and that as president, she will care and listen to all the people of these United States. So in these last three days, as I hope you are talking to people who are still on the subject. 
I hope the conversation isn't just about policy. I hope it's also about God. About thesis. If you're a small business owner who thinks Democrats are too quick to regulate, that's a legitimate debate to have. But what does it say when Donald Trump's history as a businessman is littered with so many scams and lawsuits that people in his own hometown don't want to work with him? Would you do business with someone like that? And if you wouldn't, why would you want him as your president? Regardless of what your party affiliation is. If you're a union member, think, think about who's more likely to look out for your interests. Someone like Kamala, who has stood up for working people all her life, or somebody like Donald Trump, who has encouraged union busting and sniffed his own workers. If he cheats them, what's he going to do for you? If you're a service member who's used to voting Republican because you think traditionally they've been tougher on national defense. I understand that. We can have that debate. But what does it tell you that some of this country's most decorated soldiers and Marines, men who served under Donald Trump as his chief of staff, as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, have seen Donald Trump up close and they have said that he is scornful for those who have made the ultimate sacrifice, that he does not understand the concepts of duty and honor, and that he is not fit to serve as our Commander-in-Chief. If you are Black or Latino, and you feel like too often your community is overlooked by politicians, except during election time, I, I get how you feel. But why would you think the answer is to vote for someone who has a long history of demeaning and disregarding your community, whose family business was sued for not renting to folks that look like you, who cannot apparently understand how an NBA superstar could be both Greek and Black, who suggests any Mexican crossing the border is a criminal and a rapist, who spreads ridiculous fantasies that Haitians are eating people's pets, who just this past week arranged for one of his supporters to tell jokes about black people eating watermelon and Puerto Rico being an island of garbage, right there on stage in Madison Square Garden. Do you think that's somebody who's going to look out for you? Maybe you're Muslim American or Jewish American and you are heartbroken and furious about the ongoing bloodshed in the Middle East and worried about the rise of anti-Semitism. Why would you place your faith in somebody who instituted the so-called Muslim ban? Who sat down for pleasantries with Holocaust deniers? who said that there were very fine people on both sides of a white supremacist rally. And if any of you have a dad or an uncle, co-worker, drinking buddy, who says he's thinking about voting for Trump because he's tired of cancel culture, or because he's uncomfortable with Kamala's position on transgender issues, or because he just thinks that America needs a strong, tough leader who will get stuff done. You might want to ask them, with, with respect and with love, what evidence do we have that Donald Trump actually got stuff done? And since when exactly is Trump's trademark behavior, the boasting and the bullying and the selfishness and the cruelty, since when is that a sign of strength? That is not what real strength looks like, Milwaukee. It never has been. Real strength is about working hard and taking responsibility and telling the truth even when it's inconvenient. Real strength about helping people who need it 
and standing up for those who can't always stand up for themselves. That's what we should want in our daughters and in our sons, and that's what I want to see in the President of the United States of America. And fortunately, in Kamala Harris and Tim Walls and Tammy Baldwin, you have candidates to vote for in this election who demonstrate that kind of character, who know what real strength looks like, who will set a good example and do the right thing and leave this country better than they found it. So if you are still on the fence in this election, think about what really matters. Think about the values we were taught by our parents and our grandparents. Think about the kind of country we want to be. Understand that your vote really does count. Here in Wisconsin, a single precinct might be decided by 10 or 20 votes. And those votes could determine the fate of our republic, the world that our children and grandchildren will inherit. That is an awesome responsibility. But what an extraordinary privilege that is. To live in a democracy, it gives each of us the chance to make a difference. It gives each of us the chance to make our voices heard. So, together, let's seize that opportunity. Let's vote for Kamala Harris as the next President of the United States. Let's vote for Tim Walls as the next Vice President of the United States. Let's vote for Tammy Baldwin and this whole incredible Wisconsin Democratic ticket. Let's help our friends and family members and neighbors and co-workers do the same. Because if enough of us make our voices heard, we will leave no doubt about the outcome of this election. We will leave no doubt about who we are and what America stands for. And together we will keep them a country that is more fair and more just, more equal and more free. Let's get to work.